Okay, friends, we'll jump into week eight. Um, we're going to finish up looking at conceptual art, although we're going to um, come back to it in the 80s, 70s, uh, as we move forward in the, in the class. It definitely now is a medium or becomes a medium, very much like painting or drawing. Um, a lot of you, for your Solowit assignment, uh, did this piece, lines not straight, not touching, four colors. And so this looks familiar to some of you, but um, all of yours uh, look differently. Um, it's pretty cool. All right. So hopefully you began to think, um, you began to think about the nature of artistic production. Were you Solowit? Are you making a Solowit? Are you making your own piece? Uh, and so this relationship between can the artist even does the artist need to even make their own work and does their labor have meaning within the structure of art making right so this is something that the conceptual artists were very interested in okay so we're going to recap thinking about some of the things coupled with performance right conceptual art pushes new acceptability whether it was artist books or musical scores architectural drawings we start seeing new spheres of artistic production and they push the boundaries, right? It's no longer that um, that physicality of art making, right? Um, and in a way, later on, we're going to see whether the conceptual artists, whether it's Jenny Holzer's work, this becomes a gateway to more installation and multimedia-based works, uh, especially in the 80s and up to the present day. And um, all conceptual artists really are examining the role of artistic intention. They're thinking about the meanings ascribed to the objects, right, and the evidence of their work. Um, they're often thinking about the limits of communication using language, whether that's visual or textual, and to the degree to the degree where they Im the impact of the art is visual rather than intellectual, right? Where does the work take place? And this foregrounds some of the work we're going to be doing with minimalism as well. Because the minimalists really cared about the object that they made, but it almost acted like an empty shell for the viewer to bring their own relationship to the form, right? So in that sense, the location of where um, the work's taking place could be as much intellectual as it is visual. It's going to be interesting tension to think about. Um, they end up ascribing more importance to communicating an idea than to producing a permanent object. Okay, and so they wondered: Is labor even necessary? If the idea is more important, is labor even necessary? Right. So they challenge the institutions of art. They challenge the nature of art production and the institutionalized rules by which a particular medium. Uh, is given its value. So we're going to look at at some, especially Joseph Pasuth. We mentioned this last last um, synchronous session, right? Um, and this idea that um, challenging a little bit of the art world that the institutions were um, a mediating agent for the public sphere, right? So if you think about the social value that's attributed to art. And again, I'll come back to that Vito Acconci when he was in his um, uh, you know, video that we, we looked at a little bit. He, he, he was talking about like art. It's a dangerous thing to say art because once you say it, it's, it's already a, this thing. And uh, all these artists were questioning the, the meaning of that. All right. This piece, I'm not going to talk about it too much. Uh, because I'd like you to really look at it within um, the scope of where is the art, right? You have a photograph on the left. In the middle, you have a photograph of the photograph. And on the right, you have, the f you have a dictionary definition of what a photograph is. And so this is one in three photographs. 1965 by Joseph Kasuth. Um, and he's, I, I think I mentioned, you know, he was, can't think of anyone else who, while they were doing their undergraduate work, 
at school. He was at a school of visual arts in New York City. The um, head of the school made him a professor. <laughs> it's kind of cool. And um, it's because his thinking about art was so radical and unique at that time. So you're going to do a reaction piece. I'll give a little bit more instruction when you get to the assignment. Um, we're going to skip over this right now. This is for minimal. Um, here's Kasuth's one and three chairs. And so one of the things that as a little bit of attention for you to think about is what is the most real, right? What is the most real? You have this physical chair in front of you. You have the photograph of the chair and the definition of the chair. And I asked this question in that way. What's most real? What's the most chair, right? Um, and it's, and some of you like had had a response, you know, that the, it's the physical one. But I would encourage you to think about um, how this kind of image can get distributed, um, and where does it reside in your mind? The idea of a chair, right? One and three shovels, four colors, four words. So we're looking at, you know, this red, this kind of purple, this green, this blue, and yet it doesn't say red, purple, green, blue. It says four colors, four words. And so there's this tension between where it's taking place in our own mind, stimulated by the artwork, and yet some of that added piece that I added the colors didn't take place in the work of art. It took place inside of me. Kind of cool. Um, and this is a piece called Rosetta Stone. And it makes sense if we think of like this idea of one and three, one and three. Um, here you have uh, three languages, right? Ancient Greek, hieroglyphics, and then Egyptian, I think, uh, a type of Egyptian script. And this was installed, uh, I think, in the hometown of, the, I think, the scholar who was part of the original translating of the Rosetta Stone, which then allowed um, us to have a sense, or to uh, human beings, to have an understanding of the equivalency of language. Right, this idea of equivalency of language, and where does the idea um, translate to in different texts, or in this case with hieroglyphics, also images. So it's a very cool piece. Another conceptual artist, Marjorie Strider, uh, she's kind of she also did some pop work. Um, we really didn't look at her in in pop, um, partly because I think the she was always pushing boundaries and this piece she did uh, she had 30 different empty picture frames and so she presented them as instant paintings she was trying to get passers-by aware of their environment so in a way it's conceptual in a way it's performance based um, but it's a really interesting piece and um, I'd encourage you to make a connection thinking about like what we do now with Instagram, right? And to have an instantaneous vehicle for us to record, present, um, and really curate our experience in our environments. Uh, Jan Dibbets, um, in 1969, um, would reach out to people and invite recipients um, to return one page of his art and project bulletin to him by post. So he then used their addresses to construct a world map on which he noted their locations in relationship to his own studio in Amsterdam. That was the piece. So you can see this is pushing. It's beyond painting, beyond sculpture. It's even beyond installation. It's, it's, it's using whatever the materials are, but the, the idea is what's central. Here's another one of his pieces. It was a project submitted to Projects Class Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Photos of tree shadows every 10 minutes. And so he gives instructions for this piece. I'm not going to read it all here. You could certainly, if you want, pause this, take a look at it. Okay? And that brings us to um, 
we're going to look at the artist Lawrence Wiener, okay? Let it go because of its authority and I find it a clumsy typeface. Uh, I don't know if I find it clumsy because of its association or I just find it aesthetically clumsy, but I try to avoid it. <laughs> in New York City. Uh, I went to New York City public schools. Uh, I have attempted to devote the majority of my adult life to placing work within structures where they would function just irregardless of what culture they found themselves in. That was a little bit of an aesthetic problem for people in the beginning, but I think in 2008 it's not any longer a question. <laughs> I was attempting from Rome to understand the Peter and Paul problem about how you take from one thing for another and how you make that decision. But that, has, that will lead to my understanding how to move a piece of stone with a piece of wood or something. I think in nouns as a general rule. Uh, and you can't communicate with people when you think just in nouns. So I basically have to then figure out a way to place it in a, way, in a, in a means that other people can, can see this as a specific object. That's my job as an artist. That's what I do here. That's what you do in a studio. Occasionally I'll draw something to understand a position. The drawings themselves are not sculpture or anything. They're dealing with things that find themselves on the table or find themselves in the middle of the room and how I, I looked at it at the moment. A parking lot is like a changing room for runway mannequins. When you drive in, you have to change because you're getting out of this automobile and you're going into the city either to shop or to do business or to do what you're doing. When you come back again, you have to rechange your whole mentality to get back in the car and be able to drive out on the street. Art is something that's looking for a place and banging against the walls, and that's what you think in terms of shaking things up. It's just looking for some place to be. Once it finds that place, it's no longer art. It's some sort of thing. It's culture. An artist is never supposed to assume authority. You think it, you can think anything you damn well please, but you don't assume it within the work. This is the power plant, and that's in Chauffery Bon Lambert, about half empty, half full. This is a show I'm doing for Paris. This is the maquette of a place called Castellon. Uh, this is all trying to understand something that intrigues me. That's for the new art and design high school in New York with Roger Duffy with SOM. And that's the, the place, the first studio Picasso bought in the country. And it's a piece of mine that they've painted onto the facade of it. I just went back to a typeface I had been working on. I never had the time to, to devote to it and devoted myself to it. And it's a very simple typeface. And it seems to be functioning for a while. And I guess one morning I'll wake up and it will have entered into the culture in such a way that I'll try to find another typeface. Maybe happily there's a, a need for what I do. Maybe there won't be one day. You never know. Okay, so um, he's an interesting guy. And I'm going to just go through a few of these pieces. And... Um, for your Lawrence Wiener assignment, I just you could look at these pieces, um, but you also can Google him and think about um, one that you like or respond to or don't like and respond to. Just um, you're going to uh, I'll write it up, of course, but you're going to just share a personal reaction to it. Okay, not going to be super complicated. You're not going to have to analyze it and be like it's going at a diagonal to the ground. You might talk about what, it, what that evokes for you, but I don't need you to explore it formally, okay? I'm just going to go through a couple of them. Like, for example, here. I really love this piece. A line draw, drawn from the first star at dusk to the last star at dawn. And I, you know, I could talk about this because it uh, affects me personally. I really like uh, I like that, what it evokes, it makes me think of where do I position myself in the world? Am I seeing it only from my perspective, or could I imagine other ways of seeing it? 
And so that's the type of personal reaction I might share with you if I were doing this assignment for you. So you could see there's a little tension there between the, the scale and um, the location um, and, the, and the actual text itself, which is reduced, which should be smaller, but it's quite big. And that's a funny idea if you think about, you know, price reduced and it's something that's reduced, which is smaller, gets bigger. It's an interesting tension. Okay, so, um, so for example, this piece up here, right, the spray paint there, the piece is two minutes of spray paint directly on the floor. And so is the artwork the gesture or the statement describing the gesture? I want you to think about that. Also, Lawrence Wiener did this in 1968, Declaration of Intent, one, the artist may construct the piece. The piece may be fabricated. The piece need not be built. Each being equal and consistent with the intent of the artist, the decision as to condition rests with the receiver upon the occasion of receivership. So we here, right, are encountering an idea. The artist may construct the piece. Someone else might have done it. You did Saw Lewitz. The piece may be fabricated. Or, in some cases, the piece not need, need not be built. Okay? Here's another one of his. All right. Following up with the Lawrence Wiener, I wanted to... Here's a more contemporary artist, uh, Rashid Johnson, and I wanted to discuss this with you um, or just share this with you because you can see this idea. If you remember, Lawrence Wiener talked about like a table is a thing you put something on, right? Like the art occupies this place on the table uh, or in a room, he said, right? And so Rashid Johnson, this strikes him and he creates uh, his own work around that. <laughs> when I was making the pieces that, that resemble shelves, I had just come across this book by Lawrence Wiener called Something to Put Something On. And one character says to another character, I have something for you. And the other character says, what is it? And the other character says, it's on the table. And then the first character says, what's a table? <laughs> and he says, a table is something to put something on. Uh, and I was really, really interested in this idea of something to put something on, like the kind of the semiotic of, of uh, how something exists and why it exists um, and what we call it. So I started kind of making something to put something on. And then the second question for me was, well, what do I put on the thing that I made to put something on? Um, and then I think from there you start seeing me kind of using the things that were really around me, whether they were the books that I was reading, the records that I was listening to, the things I was applying to my body, um, and all those materials began to kind of gel together to, to, to form what I thought was, a, you know, my conversation. I think there's always been this thing in my work that I've always been interested in around the domestic and around kind of hijacking things that we're familiar with and, you know, essentially kind of occupying them. And I grew up uh, enveloped in this kind of Afrocentric conversation. We celebrated Kwanzaa. And my mother wore daishikis and had an Afro. Um, but the, the thing that I think is, is most interesting for me is that 
one day they just weren't wearing daishikis anymore and there were no more afros and uh, we weren't celebrating kwans anymore you know so that that transition from afrocentrism and from this kind of interest and in kind of applying in africanness or acquiring an africanness to your parents becoming essentially just like middle class soccer moms and what have you like so that transition and that dichotomy i think uh is why humor has become so interesting for me around that conversation and around those kind of signifying materials a lot of the work that i grew up uh seeing by by black artists very much depicted a problem i wanted to make something that didn't necessarily speak to a problem so i developed a group that i called the new negro escapist social and athletic club i think some of the photographs were inspired by uh like the photographs of james vanderzee in the harlem renaissance and so it became this kind of den for this secret society and i started imagining these meetings and this discourse that would be happening with these characters in this fictional environment I think it's very much kind of invested in the, like the history of escapism. I, I always say black Americans tried to go from the south to the north. Then you have say Marcus Garvey and he says let's go back to Africa. And then you have say Sun Ra and he says don't worry about it, we're going to go to Saturn. And then you know I think uh, I always talk about a book by Paul Beatty called White Boy Shuffle where the protagonist suggests that all black people should just kill themselves. So it's this kind of evolution of this kind of escapist practice that I think is uh for me very funny. Aaron Magruder writes a comic strip called Boondocks. And he had this quote where he says, "Why does every black person think that they were chased by dogs and sprayed by hoses?" And I think what he's trying to get to is that it's important for you to in a lot of ways live your own history and if you are consistently burdened by a bigger history that may have affected your existence but is not your specific story then uh you're doing yourself a disservice it's not fully about uh, the predicament of history it's about what you're able to author yourself and how you're able to form the future rather than living purely kind of in the past okay um i hope you enjoyed that um, we'll just take a look at John Baldessari, um, I think, and maybe we'll wrap this up for um, um, the conceptual. Um, Baldessari, and we'll, we'll probably watch a quick video of his, um, tips for artists who want to sell, right? Generally speaking, paintings with light colors sell more quickly than paintings with dark colors. Subjects that sell well, Madonna and Child, landscape, flower painting, still lives, free of morbid props, dead birds, etc., Nudes, marine pictures, abstracts, and surrealism. Subject matter is important. It has been said that paintings with cows and hens in them collect dust, while the same paintings with bulls and roosters sell. So, what is a painting? Quality material, careful inspection, good workmanship, all combined in effort to give you a perfect painting. Solving each problem as it arises. It can be subject matter of religious nature as seen in a foreign country. Whatever the subject, the professional artist makes exhaustive studies of it. When he feels that he has interpreted the subject to an extent of his capabilities, he may have a one-man exhibition whose theme is the solution of the problem. It is surprising how few people who view the paintings realize this.
title of the show be Raised Eyebrows and Furrowed Foreheads. A lot of them will be sculptural. The eyebrows as cutouts will be maybe uh, three quarters of an inch above the surface. And then uh, the furrows of the forehead will be about three quarters of an inch below the surface. I wish you wouldn't sound so surprised. Yeah. <laughs> What's wrong? What's wrong? <laughs> One of the underlying themes of my work over the years, I think, uh, is trying to figure out in my mind what's the difference between a part and a whole. And I never quite get it right because a part can become a whole and a whole can become a, a part and back and forth. The art is about trimming the fat off of stock and getting to the heart of the matter. That was a mixed metaphor, but anyway. I always call it being so reductive to the point where you almost kill the patient. You want to kill each patient alive, but strip it down. To, to, you know, there's still life there, but one more stroke, it's dead. <laughs> So I'll ask you a couple of pointed questions when we when you do the kasuth, um, and also you'll have a, a room to um, respond more personally for the Lawrence Wiener assignments, um, and I'll have a shorter introduction to minimalism lesson um, also posted with this, and that's part of your overall lesson. All right, friends, have a great week.